Good afternoon and uh, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Jun Tan. I'm a producer with uh, Five Art Center. We are a performing arts collective based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So um, this is my direction. I don't really know what that means. But I think uh, to start off with, um, I just like to say that I think we're all here because we are involved in making art. We're involved either creatively or um, one way or another we're involved in making art. So I thought it would be interesting to look at some of the structures that enable the, the making of art. Um, so I've decided to maybe invite three panels. And for the first panels, uh, the first panel, uh, I invited two festival directors. In the year 2016, one of our shows, Bali, was invited to tour to several festivals in Asia and Europe. So it then made me wonder the question of programming and how does a Malaysian work fit in, into this idea of being programmed in a festival in India and also in Germany and Europe. So we're speaking to two festival directors. The second panel um, uh, will be invited, we have invited two young practitioners. And young not being young in age, but I think young as in, I feel like they are at the point of their career where there's space for choices, that they can make certain choices and that may change uh, their trajectory a little bit. So I invited two young um, practitioners. And the final panel will look at um, two practitioners who I think, who I feel have eschewed the idea of um, the kind of structures and the established platforms. And they have created new ways of sort of achieving their artistic and social agenda. So in this kind of moving away from the established platforms, do they find new found liberation? So we'll be discussing that um, in the third panel, if you're still around <laughs> at 5.30. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with the first panel, and I'm gonna invite um, Martin Denewal and Shanka Bekanferen um, to come and join us. So the idea of currency is actually what we think like when an artist gets programmed or gets to travel, there's a certain value or currency attached to that artist, even if it means just being programmed to another venue down the road. There's a sense that you have moved, moved on or moved ahead. So mobility becomes a measure of the value of a contemporary artist. Yeah. And actually this value comes from the fact that an artist gets programmed because he very much represents the local. So the local that is brought to a global. And for an artist to remain, to retain this value, he has to constantly be local. So in a way, the separation of the world has to be maintained for the value to be maintained. So I think, how do kind of performing arts festivals, you know, um, feel about this as, as yourself, directors of festivals? Um, and also in a way you are, you are kind of reiterating the suggestion that this separation um, is maintained. And I, and I say this with a little fear that I would lose my job. <laughs> because we get funding when we tour. So, you know, we get, we get invited because we are not from here, Japan. We are from there, Malaysia. So it, it benefits us to remain from there. So I'm not sure if that traps us a bit as artists. Um, maybe we can discuss this. I'll pass it to Martin, because she looks more eager. <laughs> Do I agree? <really? laughs> uh, thanks, Ju, for having me here, and thanks to the chief of staff and Hiromi. Where is she? Oh, she's already left. Uh, <laughs> for making this possible. And thanks to Shaka. It's an honor to be on this panel. Um, 
I think you're right. I think this is one of the many traps of programming that we'll talk about today. And perhaps we'll also talk about strategies of avoiding um, certain traps. Our mission really, I, I tend to talk about my festival, Festival Theater Form, as a window to the world in the particular town where I'm located. Hannover is the most average city in Germany. And um, yeah, it's really a matter of, and, and this is part of the fun, uh, dealing with cultural codes we're not familiar with, raising awareness for social, political issues that may happen around the world, figuring out what the links are between what we're dealing with and what other people are dealing with. Um, so yes, and then also, <laughs> we're trying to upset this logic a little bit next year, um, in 2019, and we've commissioned work from four artists from very different countries, Egypt, Argentina, um, Great Britain, and I always forget one of them, oh, Russia, um, to work with local people in Hanover on topics um, related to the diversity that we actually have in ethnic terms, in cultural terms, in religious terms, um, to make people aware of the fact that this outside world is already located in Hanover and is part of our daily lives. It's just not really visible in the official narrative of the city. Thank you, uh, thank you, June, for uh, having us here. Thank you for, uh, for putting us together. Thank you, Moti Bank, for inviting us. And also, uh, what is very interesting is like thank you for curating a conversation as part of the main program because that is what we are missing these days. Uh, our conversations are usually in the bar or you know after a show we are like you know, chatting, but it's never in this sort of a setup. So mobility. Uh, the festival that I used to direct uh, in 2015-16, the International Theatre Festival of Kerala, uh, was uh, in, like you know, my impulses uh, was to sort of uh, de derive from the, the, the political context that we had. So, firstly, 2014 we have the Hindu right, the rise of the Hindu right in India. We have a, a shift from the centre right to the extreme right government. So. Uh, then one could uh, you know, sort of foresee the rise of Islamophobia, violence against women, uh, deepening segregations in the lines of caste in India. So these were the impulses that I had. So exclusion was uh, sort of, you know, social exclusion was starting to like become uh, big. So uh, in that context, when I now uh, think about this idea of mobility, it's not just geographical. Like how does, how can one be mobile across class, across caste? across cultures and is it possible to sort of uh, uh, like can we get our audiences to be able to be mobile across these lines that divide? Uh, so uh, my questions were how can a festival as you know a, a space you know how can a festival become a space to question authoritarian structures of governance of you know social structures and how uh, is it possible for these festival uh, 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 concepts, festival structures, to dismantle these structures? So uh, that uh, sort of let us then you know mobility. Like that's how I understand mobility. Um, yeah, I think uh, your response, Martine, about bringing uh, invited artists to come and work with local artists um, to try and maybe address some of the issues in the local community. Um, so does it matter that this artist is from another space? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, yeah, actually, Ms. Shankar, that's like a fantastic response to, to mobility. Um, and I'm just wondering how sustained that could be. Uh, and maybe we can come to that after Martin's response. So, um, yes and no, obviously. I'm not saying it, it produces better art necessarily that the person is from abroad. Um, it's just that we have this very particular mission. We're part of a estate theater in Hannover, which means that the institution I work for produces German art all the time with German artists or German speaking artists. Uh, so we try to do something different. And then, um, as a second thought, I think it matters because um, 
And I'm not going to bring up the issue of the different perspective on things, although that may be true as well. Um, but this different perspective can be rich in many ways, and you have to, have to be a foreigner to, to achieve that. Um, but in terms of making the, the actual diversity of the population visible, we thought it would be interesting to bring in someone from a particular country who then connects with his community. So the Argentinian person will be working with the Latin American community in Hanover. In which case, of course, it makes sense to have him because he speaks the language, he knows the countries these people come from. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, I think um, being invited um, has an aspect of cultural anthropological elements. Um, sorry, this is a slide from, this is a Malaysian contingent to the 2012 Olympics. So this is, I often feel like I represent Malaysia. Um, <laughs> Poor Malaysia, but I kind of have that, that feeling. Um, so I think that being invited, you also carry a little bit of your country um, um, there. So I'm not sure how festival directors uh, approach this, whether it n it's not just the art, but there's also a little bit of anthropological um, element there. And I think that maybe the, the level of these differences? Is it mostly anthropological or is it mostly art? I think that is the purview of the festival director. So, yeah. Uh, about, you were talking about mobility across not just space, but emotional states, right? Kind of mental states. And also class. Cultures and also caste. You no, know, uh, like you know, we are like as as a country, we are getting more and more divided on the lines of caste. Like it is, it is a very ancient construct, you know, uh, which got legitimized by uh, legislations like you know the acts that sort of you know affirmative actions and you know legislations that sort of keep reinscribing these kind of uh, segregation. So. Uh, 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 like when we talked about Baling, the production, like for me, the, 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 the how uh, Baling became very important for me was firstly from where I saw it, I watched it, I watched it in Guangzhou, and uh, then uh, it's, it also has to do a lot with our history, our political history of Kerala, and how uh, like it also is a piece uh, which talks about exclusion and a body that is absent, excluded, who's never included back into Malaysia, uh, Chilpeng. Uh, this this Wangju experience was a, a like really something uh, really profound for me because uh, I came to the city in Wangju invited by Max uh, as to just an observer and then also to watch pieces there and like there was this mammoth building like uh, that was created there and like right in the middle of this building there is this you know sculpture standing with you know with, with a fist from one side it looks like a fist you know jutting out of this earth. And then you take a closer look, there are these two fingers, but you know, ripped off its flesh, and it's just skeletons. Yeah. So that starts to sort of draw you, that, that sculpture, like a beautiful building, the right in the middle of it, there is this very disturbing image, huge, like the size of a coconut tree. Now, what is this? Like you go close to it, and then it starts to take you into a certain history of the city. Yeah. So uh, it talks about the, the, the uprising and how it was you know, uh, uh, silenced, and how the history was never spoken about. And then I come and watch this piece Bali. And the moment I you know finished the piece, like you know, I was like, like we need our audiences need this piece. And I'm like, I'm after uh, Juntan and you know, after Mark, you know, I'm telling that like we have a festival, uh, we don't have air tickets, we don't have resources, we have nothing, uh, but we need you. Like, you know, how can we make this happen? And then they were also like a bit shocked and surprised. Yeah, and this crazy like, guy comes running up and saying, You have to come to Kerala. And he stares at me with his crazy eyes for like a full minute. So I think we go like, uh, okay. <laughs> And then, you know, uh, also I try to explain why it is important because uh, Kerala is also this one strange place where we have the first elected communist government in the whole world. Like we take a lot of pride in that. Uh, and, and it's also a, a, a place where we have a communist government without a revolution. So uh, through the, uh, the ballot. So, uh, and also here you have the exclusion of a communist. And in Kerala we have this, you know, we are quite, uh, there is uh, very, uh, 
subtle sense of secessionism in, 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 in the artists and the people. We in Kerala, we think that we are sort of, we were not uh, uh, influenced with Mughal colonization. We were the last to be colonized by the British. And uh, there are places in India, uh, in Kerala, which where we think that India has colonized. So uh, like uh, the regions where I work, uh, are like, you know, there are people who don't uh, uh, fall within the framework of the nation. And Chilpang on Bumhua was also someone who did not fall within the framework of the nation, though he he fought and you know lived for the nation, uh, but you know excluded. And how was that that presentation, that perspective? How did it work for the city of Kerala? Uh, uh, people very much connected with this piece, and uh, the piece also inspired a lot of theatre makers to sort of. Uh, we look at you know transcripts of discussions of uh, you know legislations of, of all these you know policies and how does that affect the body how does political life perform in our bodies so you know that was a sort of uh, a, a kind of rupture and there is like you know i know of theater makers who have been very inspired by it and like you know who have moved away from representation but rather than like more an analytic you know analytical uh, you know way approaching history so I think history became important. Like you know, until that point, like there was no uh, uh, history was not so talked about on stage. But I think your production of Baling, you know, started to like you know uh, provoked us to re look at history <laughs> and to look at those you know moments of history from the last century and what does it do to our lives today. This is rather interesting, I think, because basically what you're saying is that you invited Baling to Kerala because you saw similarities be between political situations in Malaysia and in India or Kerala. And I, the reason I had for inviting Berlin was the exact opposite. Um, we had devised a whole program of performances from East and Southeast Asia, and we were trying to tell stories that the way I perceived them had very few links <laughs> to German history or what we, um, yeah, what we may perceive as political issues today. So it was a lot more a matter of bringing in stories that we knew nothing about. And during the research we made, the festival team was rather astonished at how little we know about the Pacific War, about the presence of the Japanese in different countries in East and Southeast Asia. Um, and how things were interconnected. And that was a real discovery for myself uh, to start with. And that was something we wanted to communicate to the audience. And that's one of the reasons why we had both 10,000 Tigers by Wilson Yen, which was also, at, or was it at Tipam? I don't remember. But it was in Guangzhou. Anyway, so, um, and Baling sort of in a very different format and in a very different tradition of theater making, or performance making, shall we say, um, picked up the story that ended at the end of 10,000 Tigers. So it was a way of communicating something unknown to an audience in Hannover, in Braunschweig. So, uh, uh, very interesting. Now you can't stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> very interesting. So, uh, uh, see, uh, uh, when I uh, was curating the festival, it was the sixth, uh, sixth seventh year of the festival. So, uh, I, I'll just give you a brief idea of this festival, the, the theater festival in Kerala. So, the first year, like, you know, uh, the government felt the need to have an international theater festival because there were all these uh, young people who have gone abroad and, you know, trained themselves in theater and coming. So, I think, uh, you know, there was a need for an international platform and that's when the, they started this international festival. So first uh, year was about uh, theatre from around the neighbours. So we had theatre from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, all these countries. Uh, the second year was like when you look at the, the continents, our neighbouring continents. So there was work from Africa. The third year, the Minister of Culture was, you know, at the time it was, uh, the, uh, the, the, again, the communist government. We have, we swing from left to right every five years. <laughs> yeah. uh, so at that time, uh, it was uh, the communists who uh, were in power. And then we had, uh, the, the cultural minister makes his uh, proclamation at the end of the last, the, the validatory function that the next year it's going to be Latin American theatre. 
So <laughs> then we have Latin American place. Uh, uh, the government changed. We went back to uh, the, the center right government. Uh, the festival was sort of like you know it, it lost its uh, kind of focus and like you know it, 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 uh, for two years there were no artistic director or curation. So uh, they would just you know the committees would sit around and look at applications and choose this 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 and they would program that. So it was that random and. What was happening was there was work from Europe, Europe, Europe for the next three years. And when that happens, like our audiences started to feel a lot of, you know, lack of relatability. Like we were not understanding what this is. Like it was so distant from our culture, it was alien. So when I stepped in as the artistic director, I wanted to make things relatable to the audience. So uh, something which was far away from us, like something unknown, would like would again disappoint the audience. But something where you know we have similar socio-political, similar like you know vaguely similar uh, uh, conditions, and like you know would create a sense of relatability. So it's very interesting that you have something which is like you know you bring uh, mm -hmm. you know, something which is like like which one doesn't know. Like I'm trying to bring things that one is able to relate. Yeah, because I think um, just to reflect on that, um, you know, the, there's the issue of like uneven economies here that we talk about. Uh, mobility is enabled uh, mostly by a richer society that places a priority in uh, art that differs from another society in how it prioritizes art. So we're, we're very aware that, you know, we get invited to a different type of economy um, but the reverse cannot be said. I mean, for us to invite a work from Europe or somewhere else to Malaysia is often seen as a, a luxury, and maybe like you know a questionable luxury. It's like Pavarotti comes, <laughs> or Ed Sheeran comes to, to Malaysia. You know, so like contemporary dance <laughs> would be what is that, right? Um, so, so there is this uneven exchange of ideas actually between the cities. Um, so I don't know how you guys feel about that. So I'm just basically saying that, you know, we, we can't invite you guys. <laughs> yes, there, there is this unevenness, uh, not only in economical terms, in linguistic terms, for example, like that's one particular issue where Malay is lucky, or Baling is lucky because it's in English which makes so many things easier than if it was in Indonesian or um, any other language that Europeans tend not to talk, unfortunately. Um, so I think there are many layers of um, unevenness and power relationships that can be related to that. Um, that being said, I disagree with your statement that the exchange of ideas is necessarily unequal or uneven. Um, I, I believe that the artists we bring in bring in the ideas, <laughs> and that there's that's that's the richness um, that they bring in, and that's what we pay them for. Um, so it's a shame I can't come, or you can't invite me to Kuala Um But I, I do hope that the conversation we can have at my festival um, goes beyond that economic unevenness, or maybe you know start to think of different ways of. What does it mean by inviting a work? What does it mean by invite? What does it mean by work? Or, you know, it may not mean um, economy class ticket from Europe to, to Asia. It could mean uh, several connecting flights. You know, I don't know. So, or, or Skype conference, I don't know. So it's, it's, we can relook at the idea of what does it mean to start programming um, similar minded people who are looking for solutions at different parts of the world. And I think you know technology allows us to. So perhaps something we can consider. So also this idea is you know one of the the disaster of the modern world is capitalism. And this kind of <laughs> to drastically change the subject. <laughs> um, and this idea that um, we're always fed with the, the lure and the desire for the new, you know, the emerging um, and the cool, you know, and I, I think I fall victim to that also. So actually, then my question is, you know, how do, you know, how do festival directors deal with this? Because, you know, you're always looking out for the next or the new. 
So what is kind of stopping you or what's kind of discouraging you from maybe looking at things that are more sustained? So the idea of just say, inviting the same artist for five years, right? what, what would be the kind of challenges you might have to propose something like that? So in 2015, uh, I was fortunate to have this group from Lebanon, you know, Zukak Theatre Collective. So uh, they, uh, again, uh, when I saw one of their pieces in Xi'an in Norway, I was like, no, I went to them like, I want to, uh, <laughs> you need to come. So we know how Shankar does business now. <laughs> Uh, you need to come and then so we started the workout and the uh, group of 15 16 and we don't have air ticket funds for them so how do we do it and then, like sort of we work together so uh, like you know can you bring other work and this ensemble also play this and then they yes we have like four other pieces okay then let's have all four so which then like you know uh, sort of will start to cover their air ticket uh, so we had four of their pieces. In 2016, again, I want the same group to come back. So they come back with three other pieces. So over two years, we were able to program like seven of their works. And then again, it does leave a stronger uh, impact in, in, in the local practice. It inspires the local practice. For me, it's very important like, you know, uh, uh, when I do a festival or when I make my own work, it has to do with, it has to have something to do with our audience. So I was not setting up my festival, you know, uh, at par with any European festivals or any other theatre festival. It was it was the festival of Kerala, and what do we need? What kind of theatres we need? So this sort of started to deepen interaction. Now also the challenges, like you know, no, can't you find? And it's from, it comes from the audience. Can't you find anything new? Can't you find anyone new from this? So you know, it's like you know that is something which is very difficult to sort of you know convince. That's a challenge. And the, the stakeholders, the, the board or the investors, yeah. they, 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 were, are, they were fine with that? Are they unhappy? Like, you know, like <laughs> we, we, we want something new. We want something new. We don't want to see the same people, the same faces again and again. Uh, but then, you know, if you look at it, it's like, you know, like uh, the seven pieces that this group, uh, collective brought to Kerala were all directed by seven different people and each had a different aesthetic because they work as a collective where everyone takes turn to direct. So, you know, you have really seven different pieces and it gives you a very sort of multi-dimensional view of what, how their work is, you know, seen in their country, how they relate to us, all of that, yeah. This sort of feeds into a, a broader question maybe, which is that the performing arts market is structured in a certain way, and one of the results is that people tend to look for new or innovative or whatever, new faces, let's put it that way. Um, but of course the market is, is structured you know, intersectionally in many different ways. It also favors male white artists <laughs> to a large extent, and um, true. And um, so what, what I've come up with over the last few years is that I set up rules for myself that are not necessarily transparent in the program or that I don't talk about to my audience or even to the board, in fact. Um, but rules that um, make me look at theatre in a different may way or make me do research in a different way. So the first year I directed the festival in 2015, the secret rule that I had for myself was that I would not allow myself to program just one work by an artist. It would always have to be two. So this is, you know, very often you, s you find someone new, you see something you like, you're invited. Um, Sorry, I just I yeah. jump in and say that this session is recorded and most probably will go live. Like, we'll, we're putting it online. This session is recorded. Sorry, I should have said it's it in the beginning, but I thought it's done I should now. say it now. It's done now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that is, <laughs> No, because also as festival directors, we tend to hedge our bets. We tend to go, okay, we take a risk with this one, but not with the other one. We're risk averse in a certain way. And, and having this rule of always programming two works by the same artist meant that I, I couldn't hedge them as much. I, I had to put more money on one horse in a certain way. Um, so that was one year. And then last year, I had made the decision that for one year, I would only look at work directed or choreographed by women artists, um, which completely changes. And you won't be surprised to hear this. It changes the way you travel. You can't go to TIPAM or Festival d'Avignon or wherever you go and just stay for a week and see 50 shows, because that's a wild guess. But 40 of them will be by male artists. 
So it doesn't, you know, you can't do it that way. You have to start traveling for single shows. You have to go to Rotterdam for this and to Bologna for that. And yeah, so doing that for a year led to a program of only works directed and choreographed by women. It, had, it would not have been possible to make that program without structuring the research the way I did. So the decision starts not the moment you select the show, the decision starts two years in advance when you decide how you go about with the research. And so, interestingly enough, because we're talking about the newness of things, making that decision of only seeing work by women led to a number of new names turning up, which I wouldn't have been aware of, but the motivation to do it was a different one. So how do you feel about kind of building more sustained relationships with this new... Mm. <laughs> um, the whole of sustainability is a, a difficult one, I think, especially since my festival is in two cities. It alternates between Hannover in... Wait, Hannover in odd years and Braunschweig in even years, yes. Um, and people tend to forget us in between. Um, so I don't, I don't know how much I can build on that idea of bringing in the same person. So I also wonder whether it's the structure of festivals. Mm. There's kind of one single event um, in a year where everything has to kind of be pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, as in like it has to be, it's kind of like dazzling or you know, it's really, um, it has to be wow because it's just one single event. So a lot of resources is put into creating the the new and the, the best and the, you know, um, as opposed to maybe a structure that um, pulses through the city, um, that acts are invited every three months um, to kind of have these kind of conversations. So I, I, I don't know how you might feel about it. Because you mentioned structures, right? Performing two things. There's the festival structure and also performing on market structure. Um, so. Uh, is that stopping maybe this kind of sustained um, dialogue um, with artists? June now suddenly has started to make me feel very guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Only now. <laughs> I remember you asking me, like when you agreed to come and perform uh, in Kerala, you were also asking me, like, is there other theatre companies with whom we can meet and you know sort of observe their rehearsals and start to build a, you know, so. But that was not part of the agenda of the festival, so you know, it, it didn't happen, or I didn't think of it in those terms. But now I know why you asked me that question, and that really, you know, it, it makes starts to make me feel guilty. And I think that's the way to go, rather than like you know just coming and performing like circus animals, going back to the cage, traveling next place, or you know. Instead of that, like you know, can there be a little more of you know, sort of deep interaction between groups or theatre collectives or companies? What would that do to both parties? Wow. <laughs> we do have contextualizing formats, programs, um, small bits and pieces of interaction with local artists. We have secret agents during the festival, the fellows, young artists that are suggested by the artists we invite, who provide a link. Um, but all of that, of course, does not make for the kind of sustainability you're talking about. And it's all, at the end, it's all about the resources we have and the staff I have and the limited amount of time I have and not being able to spread it out over all year and then deciding at some point that the mission we have or the agenda we have or yeah that the, the the mission has to be clear and focused and i won't be able to spread it out actually this kind of leads to um, the next point that i want to raise um that in the title there's mobility currency and oxygen so so why oxygen um and actually i i borrowed the term from mark mark Day, the director of Berlin. um it must have been like the third city that we've had Bring, brought our performance to Berlin, and I turned to Mark and said, you, do you realize that we have started to complain less about Malaysia? Um, because when we, when we started traveling, uh, we were like, oh, we are from Malaysia. Do you know about Malaysia? And do you know about political situation? Let me tell you about Malaysia and our <laughs> political situation. Um, because the, the situation was very toxic. 
Um, this is a slide from a demonstration, a rally that happened in November 2016, calling for a um, free and uh, clean election. Um, it was called the same. So the idea that when we started touring and then we realized that, you know, we have, we have started complaining less, we realized that actually when we traveled and met different companies and different groups and saw different artists, it was almost as if we were coming up for air. You know, having a, deep, a, a new breath of oxygen. Um, because we realized that people have this different version of perhaps the same issue. So it's not just us being the worst country in the world, uh, <laughs> uh, but we were actually part of like maybe a larger struggle, a larger question. Um, so then it then led us and led me to think because it shifted my idea, perspective. So if we keep meeting people from different countries that will face with um, this kind of questioning and this kind of um, issue, could we then work out a solution together? So I'm not sure how festival directors would feel about that. Yeah. Well, obviously there are many obstacles to this. Um, you know, we have these conversations around the productions that we present at the festival and we've started bringing together different artists for these conversations. It's way better now than it used to be. Then, you know, when you came to that, it seems like way more people now. Um, partly because we thought that it would be good to um, pool resources, pool ideas, pool, pool thoughts, as in put them together and see if something emerges from that. But then again, the, the time is really limited, and I often think of the festival more as a seed that we plant, and that then continues growing on its own, and I don't really have a, a say in this, um, and neither do the artists really, because they will be. And the seed that you plant, is it mainly because you feel it's a, restra it's a resource um, constraint? As in, are you not curious about the plan? <laughs> <laughs> I am, but being in two cities this <laughs> means I leave the city as well, you right, know, right, right. It's, okay. it's a strange construction, it's one that works well in terms of funding and I think it works for the audiences too, but it means that I pack up my stuff and, and I go to the other city and then I try to, and then I do have a look where the plant is, how it's been doing that I planted two years ago, but in between I, I leave it, it's just how it's... Yeah, and also I think um, festival directors have a contract like maybe a three or five year contract. Um, they have a term, you know, they, have, they, see the, they see when they stop being the festival director. Shanka, Shanka you look shocked now. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful metaphor just to come up for this oxygen and then you dive deep down into the abyss. <laughs> or go home for some people. <laughs> It's also the other side, like you know, also uh, uh, when you are a, uh, also a, a, a maker or a theatre director, like you know how I work, uh, it also creates a lot of imbalances for the local ecology. Like when you are able to sort of uh, uh, how say it. See, uh, I, I come from my own experience. So uh, the recent work that I did, it's uh, uh, it was a commission from uh, the Zurich Theatre Spectacle. So uh, then it was not premiered in India. So I'm thinking of making a work in Zurich. So now uh, I'm starting to ask myself, so what is it that I can talk about which I can't talk about in India? So then that kind of gives me the space to sort of look at and which, you know, brings out this awareness of certain things that you take for granted. And then how do you now translate and express that to, a, to an audience who is far removed from this context? Uh, and then it, it is oxygen. You suddenly find out this space for something which you, know, which, which you know exists, but you have never addressed that or talked about in theatre. And this kind of this, you know, uh, the far away, you know, going somewhere else to perform to an audience who is like very removed from your context uh, makes you, you know, ask yourself more questions. And with that questions, with those questions, you go back, and then it, it's you, you come up with something which is not comfortable. Yeah, I feel I think that's really encouraging. 
you know, and even though you feel a bit maybe, I can't explain, but I know what you mean. This kind of disingenuous, this kind of dishonesty, like you are, you are making work for an audience that is not your community, um, but yet it helps you as an artist. Yes. So um, it's almost like a contradiction um, and a dichotomy that I think that uh, programmed uh, artists need to reconcile with. Or, or maybe reconciliation is too strong a word, I don't know. Okay, um, and one of the formats of this of, uh, panel is that these are the questions we've, I've actually forwarded them before in the email, so they have got some time to prepare. Um, but I also, I also promised them a, a question that they can ask, so that we'll, we'll all be surprised. <laughs> so actually, maybe you can ask your surprise question. So here's my surprise question for Shanka. <laughs> the question is, it's a series of questions. <laughs> Because you've, you've talked about your audience, most of all of, of the three of us, you've talked about your audience. What do you know about your audience? Do you think about your audience when programming the shows? I think you've already answered that, but if you select a show that you think is a great work of art and exactly the right thing for the festival, you program it at the festival, then very few people show up, and the people who do show up think it's rather boring or irrelevant. Do you think, think, do you still think you're right? A, in terms of your opinion on the show, and B, in terms of the selection you made in bringing it to Kerala? Okay, it's a hypothetical question, because in Kerala, uh, <laughs> there is uh, a, a never a theater that is empty. There are also people like, you know, uh, uh, you know, some 200 people always waiting outside, so no matter what the show is, uh, I have, uh, I also, uh, like in, in festivals, like, you know, I have tried to bring, like, you know, pieces that will, uh, uh, crowd puller pieces, uh, uh, so that, like, you know, you sort of get the audience into the game and, like, you know, they are, like, starting to enjoy and then you slowly start to make things difficult for them to a point where you start to offend them a little bit. <laughs> like, you know, we had, like, one show which I programmed from Japan, Arika's uh, Happy Days. It was a two-hour long performance with uh, uh, an actress Tomoko Ando on this pile of uh, heap and she's just speaking in Japanese for two hours. Uh, that was like, you know, I was shivering outside while the piece was happening, like, oh my god, am I going to be crucified after that? <laughs> and I don't see anybody walk out of the theater and then it starts to pleasantly surprise me. Uh, like, I, I, yes, I do question sometimes one makes wrong choices, but, you know, when you're sure about this, like, then, like, you know, you, I think you will be able to uh, get the sort of result that you're hoping, like, you know, with Arika, uh, this happy days, uh, it did achieve that sort of result, and people sort of accepted it. Yeah. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Do you actually have a, a dialogue with them, or do you you know talk to do you, do you address these kind of anxieties in a way, or or basically you move on quickly and actually no one really confronts you with that? Yes, I, I get like really like you know cornered by groups of people <laughs> like you know <laughs> arguing me out. So like it's a very scary situation because. Uh, people in Kerala, they get like, you know, it's like a mob psychology starts to, you know. <laughs> I don't know if you have visited the festival, some of you might know how it is. Like, it's like really like spitfire people, like, you know, uh, you are held accountable for each and every choices that you make. Yeah. Do you encounter a mob, Martin? In <laughs> Not really, but I am anxious about the results and I talk to people afterwards and I, I get very scared at moments. <laughs> um, and then of course there's the press and the media and having to explain to an artist why a certain journalist really did not understand what he was doing, uh, trying to context contextualize things. Um, and that can be a difficult moment, really, when I feel that an artist has been completely understood by someone who has a, a public, what do you call that, a public forum to make his opinion heard. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, one for you. 
one for her. I'll start with the one with Nuki. Uh, so it's not a surprise question. It's uh, it's uh, it's something which I want to know. So uh, usually, like the work of uh, festival directors, you know, it sort of comes down to the program. Yeah, so that's what you see. You look at the program. Uh, the director has programmed this, this, this. There is a dramaturgy of the festival. There is a context. What work goes into arriving there? into the program, like how do you sort of, what all do you uh, keep in the back of your mind to sort of get to this final few pages? Uh, yeah, thank you for this question. Um, because we were talking about this yesterday evening in a Taiwanese restaurant. Um, obviously there's an awful lot of work that is never ever seen and rarely talked about. Um, for me, the main point is the moment when I decide how the research will develop. Um, deciding that I, I want to have two works by every artist, deciding that it's only women, deciding that I want to have an East and Southeast Asian program. That happens two years before the festival uh, takes place. And it means, you know, this is a, a kind of cultural, sociological, historical research that we do and that my team does with me. And in many cases, and I'll, I'll use the women's edition, the women's edition of the festival as an example for this. Um, we never called it the, I, this is important, I should have said this before. We never called it the women's edition. It was never used as a marketing tool. We communicated the program like any other program, and we left people to understand what made it special. Most of them didn't realize that we told them in the end. Um, yeah, so. But let's put that aside for a second. Um, making the decision to do a women's edition means that I need to situate myself in a broader issue. I need to know what I think about feminism, about having quotas of women in <coughs> important positions in the industry. And I need my team to do the same. I think it's important that the whole festival team is part of this. So we would do workshops on these <laughs> issues. And this obviously is something that I don't even talk about usually because why would I? Um, but I think there's a certain coherence to the program in the end and it's a coherence to how the festival team, everybody who's involved talks about the, the work, the art, um, that you can sort of trace back to those initial moments and those decisions and the conversations we've been having and not communicating that it was all work by women is something we discussed hundreds of times over and over and over again because of course it would have been it would have been such a nice PR strategy and we, we would have been in all the newspapers if we had communicated it beforehand but we decided not to. Well maybe it's, a, it's time for, for not doing that and, and that was your actually very successful PR strategy um, rather than labeling it as uh, seeing it as you know even though you were trying to give voice to what you, what you saw under representation, but the fact that you didn't and people came and saw it and valued it, I think that's quite interesting. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Also, like, you took us to this very important point, like this, the 10th edition of the festival, which happened, my Kerala festival, uh, they have this uh, a theme, uh, theater of the marginalized. And they have this, you know, uh, another uh, sort of rephrasing as uh, reclaiming the margins. Now this became very problematic. Like it would have been like in you know, a women's theatre festival. So again, those structures that allows you to dismantle these hierarchies and, you know, like you know, by yesterday I was talking to uh, Professor Tadashi, you know, he was saying you when you get too politically correct, you can also fall into the trap, and then you can start to you will start to reinscribe the same structures. Question to you. So again, hypothetical. Imagine uh, you have no resources. No. Yeah, but you don't have to imagine. That's reality. <laughs> <laughs> you have a theater space, which uh, appears to be in the middle of nowhere. There is a very hungry audience. What? Would you program there, <laughs> and how would you like you know conceive something for a space like that? I guess um, I can only imagine it within the context of KL. Um, and if 
there is a space where and uh, and people are hungry. Actually, I would use a lot of comedy um, as an entry point, um, and then to bring up a lot of a lot of issues um, because you know we have issues like rapid industrialization, capitalism, creeping fundamentalism, um, and not to and actually similar to Martin's strategy, um, and to not market it or program it as such. And I think the kind of like bleeding in the ideas or slowly coloring or influencing um, an idea is something that is very useful. So not to make it too obvious. Yeah. Um, actually, we're going to open the questions to the floor now. So please ask us difficult questions. <laughs> or simple ones, yeah. No question. Okay. <laughs> We're prepared for this. <laughs> we decided that. Oh, sorry, that's a question. I just want to ask Mr. Shankar, so you have curated the international festival in Kerala. So, like, because our Sorry, very... I would have a translation of something. Once again, like, my question is with uh, Mr. Shankar, it's not a question. Um, so, are maybe like the nerves who, like, they performed in your festival last. So, how it, how, how it, how it went, like, because, like, we heard that it was, like, too late response from Kerala. So, the audience was, like... Sorry, can you repeat that once more? So, the nerves, the contemporary dance by the Nachon from Manipur, we heard that, like, they got, like, good response in Kerala, because, like, we have curated that, like, we funded that too, because like they performed in our festival. Before that, like they won our awards, like and many many juries, like they like that because like, it's very political uh, content, like in, like the Manipuri situation in the community situation. So how would the response how was it like in Kerala? Because we just want to. Know. I heard some very uh, like you know a warm like reception for that piece. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Surjit, uh, the artist, was also I, I met him after. He's that. the choreographer. He's not an artist in the. He's the choreographer, Surjit. Surjit Nungmai Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the... Uh, he's, he's the choreographer of the piece. Choreographer of the piece, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I met him after the piece. He was also, you know, you know, sort of kind of happy to have come to Kerala and perform. Okay. Yeah, it was received well. Okay, yeah. So just want to ask that. Thank you. <clears throat> My question was for Martin around uh, to what extent are you able to reshape the modality of presenting work to allow the audience to feel as though the work that you've actually curated has impacted on the presentation itself um, and also to what extent are you able to commission works and are they in collaboration when you talked about working with, uh, with local artists etc. an ongoing program. Um, the commissions are not an ongoing program, and it's something that we've come up with for the 2019 edition. I don't know if that's something that's going to continue into 2020, and the the limit we have is, uh, you know, the budget. All these co-productions are a lot more expensive, and we've applied for extra funding, and I don't know if we're going to have that in 2020. And the first question was how the actual performance changes, or. Um. It seems to me that much of the work that is uh, really exciting and dynamic and would uh, really energise our audience's imaginations are presented in their uh, home in ways that are different to yeah. proceeding much theatres or yeah. uh, you know, distance between the audience and the, yeah. the, the fact that you charge money, uh, a whole bunch of kind of contingencies which impact on the work itself and can you mitigate those impacts? Yeah, um, so I, I think one of our main um, t 
tasks really as a festival is to mitigate those impacts. That being said, I will never be able to judge how much Bali has changed in bringing it to Germany. All I can say is that we, you know, we take care of these issues, we try to provide uh, as good a translation linguistically as, it, as we can, we try to contextualize the work, we have different formats, you know, post-show talks and discussions with the artists and introductory lectures where I say a few words about the artists or about why I chose this particular performance. And then we have a special format that my colleague and friend Mark Strauss uh, invented in Frankfurt called the warm-up for the audience, which means that artists, an hour before the performance starts, choreographers or directors um, do a short workshop, 20 minutes with the audience, where the audience sings or dances or you know, gets to experience a particular methodology that the artists themselves use when creating the work. So, you know, we have all these different ways of coming into the work, experiencing bits and pieces of it before they actually see the, the performance. And then they talk back and la la. So uh, we try to do a good job of that. But of course, it will never be the same. And it's, and the, the one particular work of art is of course framed by the whole program. And having Balin after 10,000 Tigers does something to Balin and does something to 10,000 Tigers, obviously. So actually then, this is quite interesting. What, what do you think of good relationship with the audience? What does that look like to both of you? <laughs> what does it mean? It's obviously consideration, I think. <laughs> Thank you for prompting. <laughs> <Consideration>. <laughs> Your board, and then you don't care about your board, so. <laughs> I think I lie to the audience too, don't I? Yeah. Yeah. I um, am very selective in how I talk about the work, the program. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm pandering to their taste or their opinions, but I will not overwhelm someone with a discourse on post-colonialism if I think there's a different way of explaining the work that does justice to the work, then I will choose a different way. Um, yeah, a good relationship to the audience means challenging them, I think. Yeah. For me, never to starve the audience, not to overfeed them. So. That is a good relationship for they are like you know they, they, they are engaged, they are questioned, they are challenged, uh, but they are also like they, they get a sense of ah, I get it. Like you know, they need to go back with something. Then it's a good relationship. I had a nice conversation with a doctor recently, um, because now all of a sudden I'm part of a club of people who don't deal with the arts, so I'm constantly finding myself in the situation of having to explain what we do and why that's important. And then uh, in explaining why we do what we do, all of a sudden the doctor goes like, oh, so I don't have to like it. It can do all these other things. It can challenge me, it can ask questions about issues, it can be about changing things in society. I didn't realize. And that was an interesting moment. A good relationship with the audience also means explaining that the work doesn't necessarily have to please them, or not all of the time, or not exclusively. Uh, this is a question picking up on something we said, Martine, about the festival looking for the global in the local issues, uh, micro immigrant communities. And of course, an international festival has a high status, and community arts has typically a low status within the public perception of the arts. How do you ensure that uh, the festival retains a high status? I'm hoping that won't be too difficult. Um, I, I, I don't perceive community arts in that way. That's the starting point, I think. And the artists we work with uh, don't either, because they've been working with communities for decades, some of them, um, and have never perceived their art as less valuable or less challenging or less relevant, because they work with people who, who don't have any professional training for example. 
And one of the performances that we're going to produce um, is La Velocidad de la Luz by the Argentinian theatre maker Marco Canale, which was one of the most amazing performances I've seen in the last year. And you leave the theatre with a sense of richness um, that I've rarely encountered. And I don't think a single soul will walk up to me and say that this was not serious art or this was not incredibly valuable in what it does, in artistic terms and in social terms. Um, yeah, so I, I think the choice of the projects and the artists is, is fundamental. And I hope to challenge these notions. Actually, there are no um, questions. We can also have responses because I think there are some festival directors also in the room. So feel free also to kind of share. Uh, this is sort of a follow up question to the previous one, so maybe all three of you can respond to that. So, in picking and choosing the program to go to the festival, um, you know, there's always this tension between catering to the international audience vis-a-vis -vis the local audience. So, how would you position the, the festival? And uh, when you consider what shows to go to the festival, would you think about it more for the local audience or for the international crowd? Okay, thank you. The festival that I did, like 99% of our audience are local audience yeah. from Kerala, like you know, Malayalam speaking audience. So for me, they are the reference. So. <laughs> yeah, and my festival, maybe, I don't know, 95% of the audience are local audiences. So it's them I think about. But I enjoy having a conversation with colleagues, and the conversation happens partly through the program, it happens partly through the shows I choose. And and we compare notes, <laughs> and um, yeah, so that exists. But the audience is paramount, the local audiences. Actually, we've kind of run out of things to say, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna be the teacher to let you out uh, early. <laughs> Um, actually, we don't have any more questions or um, no more comments. I'd like to thank Martin and Shanta very much. Um, and thank you for coming. So our next panel will be at um, 3 o'clock. Yeah. And we'll be talking about uh, pressures and contradictions in uh, Malaysia and Thailand.